Obviously, the last couple of years in Iraq and Afghanistan have, have smashed former paradigms of strategic thinking from the post-Cold War. Uh, so now we've entered a strange post-post-Cold War phase, one where I think that threat and danger is now articulated in terms of subjective uh, means rather than objective uh, environments that we have to react to. And as a result, I think strategy nowadays is conceived less in traditions of traditional campaign, military campaigns like World War II, and more like risk management, which has profound downstream effects for actually what goes on on the ground. Uh, certainly, there's a, there's a lot of interest, and I'd say sort of following the Cold War and in technology investments and in anything from F-22 fighter jets to frigates, uh, that technology can be the decisive arbiter of victory. But as we're learning against foes that are not technologically advanced, that technology is actually of, uh, can have limitations uh, from basically from what the real state is on a soldier's body to carry gizmos and gadgets and how actually that can, that can slow down the soldier in a firefight to ideas that technology doesn't matter what types of gizmos or gadgets you have, but approaches. So do we use, for example, anthropology or social science to understand uh, the, quote, enemy, unquote, rather than trying to use some sort of satellite spy system. I think we are entering a, an era now where we're seeing the end of specialization. And I think what, we, what we're looking at are, are highly functioning generalists. So for example, uh, for, for myself, for example, having a background as a paratrooper, also who work with Amnesty International, and who work with DynCor International uh, in places like Africa, I understand I have a sort of a, a, trium a triangulation of private, public, and nonprofit sector expertise that has given me sort of a language and vocabulary to understand uh, how these sort of stovepipes of information, knowledge, and paradigms uh, all miscommunicate, and how I can help translate those miscommunications so we have a more coherent and holistic strategic uh, vision of the future. The question of the privatization of force in Iraq and Afghanistan is an excellent question that I think often gets short shrift. Um, it's easy in Washington, D.C. to view this as a purely anomalous effect of Iraq and Afghanistan and that there's no desire to have another Iraq or Afghanistan. So this industry, the private military industry, will also disappear with Iraq and Afghanistan, assuming Iraq and Afghanistan ever disappear. Um, uh, However, I think it's, it'd be foolhardiness to assume otherwise. Uh, it, we have created a $50 billion or so dollar industry that is truly global. Um, these companies, although they're, they're based in the U.S., employ mostly international um, employees from places, when I was in DynCorp, from places like Fiji or from South America or South Africa or you name it. And we've created skill sets so that these individuals can go back to their own homes and create uh, companies of their own. And they're starting to do this. They are, they, they've created smaller companies uh, that now work for large companies like DynCorp or Blackwater or, or whatever you, other major companies are out there. And we've created a sort of a globalized, in some ways, market for force. Now, I'm not a categorically against the use of, of uh, private security companies or contractors, and we have to be careful that private security companies and contractors are two different categories. Um, but I think we need to be more salient and prescient about what this might look like for, because I, I think it'd be, um, again, foolhardy to assume that this industry will simply disappear uh, you know, at the end of our engagement in Iraq or Afghanistan. Following Iraq and Afghanistan, it seems to me that foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, will become a bit more isolationist in the years ahead. Um, however, it's obviously clear that some continents like Africa are becoming strategically more important, more important than they ever w than it ever was in the Cold War, mostly due to issues uh, like climate change and natural resource uh, issues and scarcity issues, as well as migrations and, and epidemics and all sorts of, of things that we now conceive, we, we recognize as threats 
to stability and order globally, um, not just a, a state like the Soviet Union. So Africa in some ways is, is strategically on the rise. Also China is very interested in Africa, which makes the U.S. interested in Africa, although I don't think that there's a Cold War-like rivalry between China and the U.S. in Africa. Uh, also, a areas like Somalia are emerging potentially as uh, Afghanistan was in the 90s, as a hotbed of, of radical uh, ideologies and terrorism. Guinea-Bissau in West Africa is, is emerging as a narco state. Um, and these now formerly small, seemingly small uh, countries have global inf influence and impacts. So for that reason, uh, it's, it's critical that we not give Africa short shrift and that it, it, Africa will become, in my opinion, increasingly important, not just to U.S. St strategy, but also just foreign policy writ large.